You want it? We have it. The hottest mortgage and real estate strategy broadcast in the nation. A Smarter Way Home with your host, Danielle Boot and Victor Bales. 50 years combined experience ranked in the top 1% in the nation for home loan originations 2020. Promise to expand your knowledge, utilizing creative mortgage financing and home buying strategies. Build a bridge for a better quality of life. Get your brain cells firing for a smarter way home. Welcome to A Smarter Way Home. I am Danielle Boot. And I am Victor Bales, and we want to welcome everybody to our first podcast here regarding mortgage financing or creative mortgage financing and home buying strategies. And uh, we hope you listen along because I think we're going to get some brain cells fire in here. And as we talk about real estate and mortgages, you know, in podcasts, these are like books, uh, the way I look at it here. And uh, each book has a lot of chapters. And I thought that uh, our listeners maybe want to understand who are we, where did we come from, and why should I listen to these guys? So I thought today's broadcast, we'd start with you, Danielle. We've pulled your name out of the hat, and we're going to actually talk about you and let our listeners know what makes Danielle Boot tick. Okay, so I want you to tell me what drove you into the mortgage industry, and I want you to go way back and... Uh, Where'd you grow up and how'd you start here? Uh, where'd you grow up? I grew up in Chicago. Um, I was born in Chicago. I am the oldest of four children. Um, I'm the oldest grandchild on both sides of the family. Uh, grew up primarily in the suburbs of Chicago until I was about 16. Okay, you said four kids. Are you the only girl? No, I have a younger sister. Have so younger it was two sister? boys, two girls. Two girls, okay. And uh, uh, you mentioned you were in a working class family. Tell me about that. My dad was a mechanic. My mom was a stay-at-home mom, which is common back in the 70s and 80s. Um, even before that, all, my grandparents were all um, laborers of some nature. W what did your father do? My dad was a mechanic, okay. primarily. Auto yeah. mechanic? Auto mechanic, yeah. Auto mechanic. Your father died at an early age. Tell me about that. He did, yeah. He, unfortunately, he passed away at 30 from cancer. Wow. Wow. And so you're the oldest daughter. Yeah. He was 30. How old was your mom? My mom was 28. I and was seven. You and were my, seven my brothers years old. were five and I think 18 months old. Okay. How, what, how did that make you feel when you, you, you kind of looked outside, looked around the family there? Would you see about you know, how that affected your mother? This must have had a, a, a strange, you must have had a, some type of strange feeling. What, what were you well, it was, yeah, definitely a very difficult situation. It makes you grow up very fast when you experience that level of loss at a young age. Um, my mom, a uh, very smart woman, uh, a huge, huge fighter. She did an amazing job raising us pretty much on her own. But she never really had more than a high school education, so she never worked much outside the home. You know, she'd have little part-time jobs here and there around the holidays maybe to earn extra money, but she was um, home all the time. You know, we basically grew up on my dad's death benefits from Social Security. Wow. We were very fortunate for that. We had what we needed, but we didn't have a lot of extras. So I grew up knowing that... Um, a lot of things could happen in life. Like, you know, even at a young age, I saw maybe friends that had parents that were divorced in the 70s, um, or they could die. You know, that's something that you can't plan for, you can't adjust for. And when you think about coming from a working class family, my dad might have had a little life insurance, certainly not a lot. They didn't have a lot of savings. You know, we lived in a nice home, but he worked very hard to provide for the family and he was just suddenly gone. So that had a huge impact on my life. So you've seen a big struggle with your mom trying to take care of you and you and your siblings. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I, I see here that uh, you wanted to become a nurse. Is that because you wanted to be a caretaker from what you went through? Well, why did you want to be a nurse? Y you know, I, I don't know. I guess that's a great question. No one in my family had ever gone to college. And it was, you know, in my situation growing up in the 80s, it wasn't like we couldn't have we talked about college, and I actually became a certified nurse's aide when I was about 15 years old. They really? had a program at the public high school I went to in Chicago, that, um, or specifically Elk Grove Village, um, that allowed us to do like a co-op in the summer at a community college. So I literally took a bus 
to go to the community college and took this program. I think it was about two months. I probably went to school every day that summer to get a state certificate so that I could eventually get a job. And my then my goal became, hey, maybe I could look at nursing. Maybe I could go to college. So I then moved to Michigan in my June, beginning of my junior year. Wait a minute. That was at, at six, six, 16. 15. At, at, I was about 14 or 15 when I did the certified nurses thing. Okay, and then you moved to the Detroit area when? Before, right before my 16th birthday. Why did your whole family come here? Yeah, my whole family came. Why? So my mom got a job in okay. Michigan um, through somebody she knew at work and ended up uh, getting remarried years later. Okay, so that had to be a struggle too, uh, uplifting all your friends and all that. You're, you know, yeah. you're a teenager. Yes, and we had a very close-knit family with my grandparents and my aunts and uncles, so it was uh, definitely a difficult transition. Back then, I remember that, um, and this you know, make you sound old, but a long distance minutes were about 10 cents a minute. And I would literally have a phone bill because I always worked, uh, but I spent a ton of money on a phone bill every month just to try to keep in oh, touch with everybody yeah, in oh, Chicago. You mean the cell phones when they first came out? No, just a landline. Oh, that's, that's Remember? right. Remember yeah. calling cards? Oh yeah. Like you'd have a calling card and you know, yeah. you couldn't call for free. So. Okay. So you came to the Detroit area as a teenager here and, uh, I see uh, you went to college, but you were afraid of student loans. Explain a little bit about that. Well, I, you know, um, when, I, when I got here, I started working pretty quickly. So work became, you know, I did make some friends, um, but it was very hard. I ended up graduating from Canton High School, which was huge. You know, there were two campuses at the time. The Canton High School was um, significantly larger than where I came from. And you really couldn't get into uh -huh. sports and stuff that late in the game. It, that wasn't easy. So I started working and that became, uh, you know, my outlet and my thing in life. Um, I did work in long-term health care, you know, assisted living kind of a thing. And then I started looking at college opportunities to go to school. Um, I started my college career at Madonna in Livonia and I did get accepted to the nursing program, but I didn't understand how to finance it. I had a little bit of help from my mom, but not a ton because she didn't have a lot. And um, I didn't understand student loans. Okay. So I was trying to work full time going to nursing school, which never works. You know, you have very heavy science load. And then I kind of shifted gears, uh, still taking classes, but kind of looking at it going, OK, you know, how am I going to get this accomplished? Because I have to pay for this and still work. And, you know, I, I, nobody ever explained student loans to me that, Hey, when well, you're going to get a job and you're going to make this much money when you graduate so that you could afford to pay them back. So I was afraid of them and, well, and didn't take them and didn't stick with school full time. I never completely stopped going to school, but then I started working full time. And my first job in the mortgage industry, um, was about two years out of high school and so I got you're 18, you're 18, 20 years old, 19. 19 yeah. I think I was old. 19 cause I graduated high school when I was 17. And so you took this job to help pay for student loans or help pay your education. So you don't have student loans to, well, just to support myself. You know, I had a small car payment. I was lucky enough that, uh, you know, my mom did help me uh, get a vehicle, but I paid for it. And um, that's how I went to work and that's how I went to school. And um, my mom at that point decided to move out of state with my siblings, and I decided not to go. Wait a minute, hold on. So, you guys made moved from Chicago to the Detroit area, stayed mm -hmm. a few years, about four years, I think. Three you or went four to years. some college, and then now mom is going to get up and leave with the other siblings. Yes, and left, and you decided to stay here in Michigan alone. Yes, yeah, I was going like I was going to school, and then I had just gotten a job full time in the mortgage industry. So I was hired as a backup receptionist. A back so this oh, is oh, wait a minute. There's not a the receptionist. How did there is a such thing as a backup okay. receptionist? So in 1989, there was no voicemail in an office phone oh, yeah. system. Okay. And um, interest rates were dropping from double digits. So rates in the 80s had been between probably 12 and 18%. Mm -hmm. And by 1989, they had dropped below, you know, to that 10% range. Oh, so now they need more people. So you got to be a backup. Receptionist. I got to be the backup receptionist because someone had to answer the phone. Uh -huh. Nobody had cell phones. Nobody had direct phone lines like we have today. So I literally was at a desk in the corner. And if the gal I worked with, her name was Ellen, if she couldn't answer the phone, <laughs> I got to answer the phone. 
So, but it was the the best paying job that I ever had. I think I made seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour, and I went out and found an apartment uh-huh. to live in. So my I moved into an apartment, um, no furniture, and yeah. uh, thought oh, I'm going to stay in Detroit. And if it didn't work out, my backup plan would have gone back to Chicago. Okay. Well, well, we got better pizza here in Detroit, by the way. No, we don't. We don't. We're not going to debate the pizza okay. dialogue oh, okay. between Chicago and Detroit. Okay, so you're a receptionist. You're 19 years old. Yep. Um, when did you meet your husband? That was about that time. So we actually worked together. Um, at the mortgage office? No, no, no. We were at a, we worked at a nursing home. So I was working in long-term oh, wait, care. Hold, hold on. Back up here. Wait. So you're a reception, a backup receptionist. And because of the nursing degree or the the school you took, you also worked at assisted living. No, that was before. Okay. So I worked I worked in long term health care. Okay. Also while going to school, then I took a break from that and um, ended up finding a job in the mortgage industry. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay. So how did you meet your husband then in, in at that place that you worked at? We yeah we both worked at a oh. nursing home yeah, okay. in Farmington. This was nineteen years old. Yeah. How old were you when you got married? 21. 21. Yeah. And you were still the backup receptionist at the mortgage company? No, within six months of being at the mortgage company, I um, got a promotion. At first, I was a junior processor, and then I went into processing. So they were swamped. Um, It was a huge uh, refi boom, a lot of people purchasing houses because rates were falling. Um, by early 1990, they were about 10, 10 and a half percent, if I recall, and we were busy. So they taught me, well, here, Danielle, can we teach you how to order a mortgage payoff? Okay. So I did that, and then they taught me how to order a verification of mortgage, a verification of uh, employment. They taught me how to order a credit report. So I just, I, I loved the paperwork, believe uh, it or not, and, you know, because of I, I hadn't completely given up on nursing, but I knew I couldn't do it working full time. So Okay. And then, so that started your career, and you have never been out of the mortgage industry since your your first job. Then, basically, um, you know, I took a little bit of a pause in the mid nineties because I got laid off, and then that's when Jim and I started our business. Okay, okay. So, and what business was that? Uh, we owned a home inspection company for twenty five years. Okay, and you got out of the mortgage business for a little while. Well, I I got laid off, so I we you know we got married. Had started having kids a year later. So by the time uh, the mid-90s hit, there was a recession, particularly in the Detroit area. You know, Detroit feels recessions before the rest of the country. So there was a little recession, and I worked for a small company, and I got laid off. And that was about the time we were expecting our second daughter. And um, I stayed home for a few months and then got this idea to buy a franchise and start a company so we bought a franchise, started a home inspection company, was still while Jim had a full-time job. Uh-huh. And then, you know, two kids, and I, I took a couple years to start that business. And then I ended up going back to the mortgage business. And when you went back into the mortgage business, uh, what position did you take there? Uh, processing. Yeah, I was in processing or like an operations manager for a lead okay. loan officer. And then what made you get out of processing into loan origination? I mean, t- take me on that journey. Well, it was really an accident. Um, My mom, years later, you know, my mom moved out of state for a few years. And then when I had my oldest daughter, she decided to move back to Michigan because she wanted to be a grandma and she wanted to be close by. So my family was gone for about three years and then came back. And my mom um, decided to go back to school or go to school. She was actually, um, she decided to go to nursing school and Ended up, we had another family uh, kind of a emergency occur when my little sister got sick when she was 12. My daughter, Caitlin, was about six months old at that time, and my mom ended up needing to go back to work um, to help take care of my sister and deal with everything that we had going on there. I said to my mom, I said, well, why didn't you become a loan officer? And she said what does a loan officer do? So I told her what a loan officer did. I worked for a small mortgage broker in Plymouth, talked to my boss and said, hey, would you hire my mom if I train her to be a loan officer? And, you know, I think my mom must have met with the owner of the company. And she said, sure. You know, back then we didn't have to be licensed. So I I had spent a lot of early years in my career, even as a processor, training 
loan officers, wow. how to write a mortgage, how to do the paperwork, what documents we need, and we send them out on the street. Some of those gentlemen that I trained years ago are still successful loan officers 30 plus years later. So with my mom, I literally, um, back then, I, was, I had gone to work at this small company in Plymouth. They allowed me to work at home, which was unheard of back then. I had to get a phone line in my house. They brought a copy machine over. And then my loan officers would literally come to my front door with a box of files and say, here, Danielle, here's the deals we brought in this week. And I would process them, copy them, send them out to underwriting. I trained my mom to be a loan officer at my kitchen table. And I told her, I said, well, you've got to build relationships with local realtors. And I gave her a suggestion of who was top in the Plymouth Canton market at the time and said, go make friends and, you know, let people know you're a loan officer and here's how we're going to do a mortgage. And she went out and became very successful in a short period of time and um, ended up being a loan officer. And what transitioned Mm -hmm. was that she ended up getting hired as a buyer's agent at one of the top real estate teams in the Canton area. So she went from a loan officer to be a real estate agent. Correct. And she was one of the first buyer's agents in Detroit in the mid-1990s. Wow. And, you know, she worked for a great team. They did a lot of business together. So are you saying in the 90s, they only had real estate agents? They didn't have the buyer side or the seller side? Yes. So this was a unique... This was new when they... This was new, the The buyer's buyer's agency. Yep. Wow. And we had buyer's agents, seller's agents, yeah. dual agency, things of that nature. So when she became a realtor, she then had to connect with a loan officer to refer her clients to. And I kept co- you know, connecting her with people that I worked with. Here, try this loan officer, yeah. try that loan officer. And she was not really happy with the with services. Okay. The services that they offered, okay. you know, or the clients would not click with that particular person and that personality. So my mom said to me, she goes, Danielle, can you write a mortgage for one of my clients? I said, well, I don't know. Let me go talk to my boss. So at this point, I go to the company I worked for and I said to the owner of the company, I said, hey, could I originate a couple mortgages um, just for my mom? You know, I've tried to get her connect with other people. It's not working. She's not happy. Her clients aren't happy. And he said, sure, you know, you'll do your job as a processor during the day. You can originate at night and, you know, evenings and weekends. So I started doing business. Um, that's when I started. It was just kind of an accident. What I, year was this now? Oh, gosh. 98, 99, okay. I think. So you've been originating loans. Yes. From 98, 99. Yeah. Wow. That's yeah. over 20 something years just originating in itself. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then I took, you know, I took a little, a little, a little breather. Um, and then we had two more children. Mm-hmm. In the in 2000 and 2003, and by that time I, I was working as really um, a team lead for a top producing loan officer, and I was still originating, and I I was able to work from home with the kids when they were small, so that you know gave us a lot of flexibility, but it got to the point where I was making more money originating than I was being a team lead for a top producing. And loan officer. what about the home inspection business you ran with your husband? You know, he, I was only helped with that for the first couple of years and then he took it from there. He took it. So that ran by itself and you, yeah, you, I did the accounting. You got brought into the world of yeah. loan origination. Yeah. Okay. So that was the nineties. Uh, so a step forward a little bit. So where'd you go from uh, that company? Did you expand? Uh, what'd you do? You know, eventually I'd made the decision to go out on my own, probably about 2006. You know, we were out living in Pinckney. We had been in Livingston County for quite a few years, and there were no really not a lot of mortgage companies out here. And I didn't really want to continue to work in the Plymouth Canton area because it was a far commute. You know, we had daycare issues, we had school issues with kids. So back then, there were um, mortgage opportunities that they called a net branch. So you mm-hmm. could be a loan officer of your own branch and just kind of do your own thing. So I joined um, a company that would allow me to do that. And I basically opened my own little office in Brighton and just was originating at that point solely. Okay, so you were originating loans, but how did you build the business? How did you get your name out there? How did you build uh, relationships with referral partners? I got involved in the community. 
So I joined Women's Council of Realtors, which I had been a member of in the Western Wayne County Corridor for many years. I was also involved in the Association of Realtors in Western Wayne County for our inspection business. So I knew the basics of marketing. You know, I had worked for some of the top loan officers in the Detroit area for many years, paid close attention to what they did. And I thought, well, we're going to do this out here in Livingston County. So I got involved with the Association of Realtors the Women's Council of Realtors, uh, you know, other community organizations. I was always involved in my kids' school, sporting events, church, things of that nature. And you just start slowly getting it out there that, hey, I'm a loan officer. If I can help you, give me a call. So when did you, I guess, discover that you're a, you're a pretty successful loan officer and somehow you got it to, 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 have people gravitate towards you? When did that click in to say, boy, your way is working? You know, I don't, I've never looked at myself as a sales person. Okay. But what I was able to do is educate and teach a consumer, a client, a friend, a family member about what their mortgage options were, how the mortgage process worked. And I got feedback from a lot of people that said, nobody has ever told us that, Danielle. But I looked at the back, I looked at the business, let's say backwards. I knew it from the inside out, not not from the outside sales perspective in. I knew all the back end. You know, I knew the documents, how to calculate income. You know, I could calculate somebody's tax returns, a self-employed borrower. And I could take that knowledge and share it with people and explain things to them, not in a high pressure, fast talking angle, but to give them an education. So this was actually just kind of put into your DNA from the uh, assistant uh, receptionist that Mm -hmm. just kind of got ground in and it become, it's second nature. Yeah, it it was, it was, you know, and I enjoyed that. You enjoy it. Yeah. Yeah. What do you enjoy about the numbers and the the creativeness about the mortgages? Well, it's not cut and dry. Every client has an individual situation and their mortgage is their biggest, their home is their biggest asset, their mortgage is their biggest liability. And when you start to see it as a tool to be able to use to your benefits, kind of like student loans, nobody likes student loans and student loans can be dangerous. We won't get into that topic today. You don't, wait a minute. You don't think any of this has to do with your upbringing, losing your father at an early age, wanting to be a nurse, wanting to be a caretaker. You don't think any of those character traits come into the, they, this whole thing yeah. about you wanting to educate and take care of people? They, it, no, it prob- it absolutely did. But early on, I didn't see it that way. Yeah. You know. And the other thing that I think really drove me the underside, I had told my mom when I was about 17 years old that I was going to buy a house before I got married. And you know, nowadays we would, if you heard that from your daughter, right, you yeah. wouldn't be surprised. You'd be like, awesome. Go, yeah. t- tell me what you need to know and let's get you ready to buy your first house. I looked at it and said, that, you know, the home to me as a child was everything. Mm-hmm. It was everything. You know, that is where you lived, you played, you slept, you cried with your family. You know, with all, the earliest memories that I have were all revolved around the home. So it, 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 it became important to me for my future, not because I expected to get married and get divorced or any, I mean, and we, obviously there's a million scenarios in life. Life is totally not easy, but I knew at, a, at an early age that if I could provide a home for myself, whatever happened in life, I could handle it. So you it, have your rock. Your, yes, your rock. it was the bedrock. Yeah. yeah. Okay. yeah. And, and for me to say to my mom at 17, well, I'm going to go home someday. You know, that was not something that a girl in 1986 or 1987 would have said, you know, yeah. women, women were going to college at that point in time. And you were single at this time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah I was, I was still in high school. So a single girl. Yeah. The, in high yeah. school <laughs> going, you, you're going to own a home when, yeah. when the, the percentage of women owning homes in the late 1980s was very, very slim, right. very, right. very slim. And, um, you know, my mom taught me some good lessons though, about building credit about being responsible, about, you know, managing money. Not that we ever had a lot to manage, but, you know, she taught me a few things. I learned a lot more over the years, but that was my focus at 17. In fact, I tried to buy a mobile home in Plymouth. Mm. 
mm-hmm. and actually got approved for the loan for a single wide mobile home, but the park wouldn't approve me because they thought I was too young. Really? Yeah. They, they, they were afraid at 19 or something that I was going to be a partier. So honestly, I remember being really disappointed and that's when I got my apartment mm-hmm. and, um, you go, yeah, it was one of the best blessings ever um, because we, I ended up, I did buy a house actually. Um, Jim and I bought our first house about six months uh, after being in the mortgage business. And I looked at that and went, well, this isn't that hard. Mm-hmm. You know, um, this isn't hard, but there, there hadn't been, one of my grandmothers did work. My other grandmother did not work, but there was no history of any woman in my family would even ever consider owning real estate outside, other than within her marriage with her husband because the husband was always the primary breadwinner. But I grew up knowing that sometimes... Life happens. Life happens. So that was my focus that I'm going to support myself. And then I figured out, oh, buying a house is not that hard. Do you pay your bills on time? Can you prove it? Do you have income? And here's how we decide what you can afford with a budget. Um, and Jim and I were both paying rent. And, and um, we kind of said, well, hey, what do we think about buying a house? And we weren't even really that serious. I mean, we were we were together for a while, but it wasn't like we didn't have plans to get married yet, and we went right, out and bought a house. Right. That's, that's very I, – I just keep thinking of – how you became who you are because we look at the uh, uh, from an early age the trials the tribulations all these little character builders uh, had a something to do with you making those decisions yeah. and becoming who you are and i was you know when you look back now you know i i have a late october birthday by today's standards i would have started school a year later mm-hmm. so i was never a, a stupid person in school but I struggled to get bees, struggled to get bees. My brothers were actually way smarter than me at, at those ages. And, you know, my, I remember even having the conversation with my mom because even in high school, um, I started high school in remedial math because I struggled with math, just struggled. And I didn't want to be always a class behind my, my, you know, cohort and my grade level. So I started taking summer school in math, or I'm sorry, in high school, not because I had to, because I wanted to. So I started in the remedial math. And then between freshman and sophomore year, I took, I don't even remember what it was, was it algebra or something like that in the summer, just to try to be in geometry in my sophomore year. And I think I did that for two or three summers, just to try to even keep up with the class. And, you know, I ended up graduating high school with a, a decent GPA. I wasn't a terrible student, but I always thought that I was not good nice. and, and not a good student because I had cousins that were really smart and I just never thought I measured up. And, and that was a personal thing. It wasn't like anybody beat me over the right, head with right. it. But Right. So uh, let's fast forward a, a few years here because here in the last five, eight years have really kind of transpired your life uh, uh, regarding mortgages and uh, all those around you. Uh, Take me through that journey. Well, you know, like I said, about 15 years ago is when I opened my first branch in in the Livingston County, Brighton area. Um, Most of the time it was just me. Then eventually I would hire a processor. Then along the way, um, for a while, I worked for a local bank with all the turmoil, um, back in the 2008 era, and um, occasionally I had a couple loan officers that worked with me, um, went through the downturn in 2008, and just kind of didn't let go. You know, I felt, you know, when when we look back at, you know, 2005 through 2008, that's when kind of Detroit was hit. The real estate market started to hit the skids in 2005 before the ultimate crash in 2008. And it was real difficult at that time, super difficult, because um, the dot-com mortgage companies started to come out. The 800 mortgage companies started coming out. Mm -hmm. And we had all of that, now we can call it predatory lending. The, uh, you know, uh, scary adjustable rate mortgages. Option arms. Option arms, interest only. And we had a really difficult time competing because everybody wanted... Um, a 0.99% interest rate. Do you remember when a a local company um, originated that? They would charge people $10,000 in closing costs and give them a ridiculously low interest rate that would only be low 
a year or two. Yeah. You know, and I've always told my clients, you know, uh, there's not a bad mortgage in the world, but it was the failure of the mortgage industry to educate the clients on this could be a double edged sword. So Absolutely. They, they only told them the positives, never the negatives. Absolutely. You know? But if they and taught even if, them the dynamics, it could have been a great tool for that particular borrower. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. But there, you know, there was definitely a lot of, uh, unscrupulous lending out there and that made it really difficult. I mean, um, we, we did not weather really well through that 2008, 2007, 2008 period. Those were tough times. Very so. tough times. Yeah. So. Wow. So, cause I remember, uh, and after that, uh, real estate crash, that's when the licensing came. Yes. About that, yep. I uh, got licensed in 2010. So I was at a yep. bank for a couple of years when the licensing came out thinking that that would be a safe haven and nobody thought that the banks would fail. So they almost, the bank I was at almost failed. Um, they had to deal with the TARP money and investors and stuff like that, which made lending extremely difficult. I mean, I remember back then having loans and underwriting, solid loans that we originated mm -hmm. And the guidelines would change while they were in underwriting and the loan would get rejected because something changed, you know, in the guidelines. So it was an extremely difficult time. I remember uh, when, uh, yeah, the, the implodometer, when the banks would crash, oh, yes. they'd implode. And when they came in with the licensing, I mean, that era wiped out 70% of loan mm -hmm. originators. Yeah. You know, and uh, you made it through that. Yeah, ba barely by the skin of our teeth. Well, I, I said to my husband, I said, it's better to be underemployed than unemployed. And if I'm a loan officer, I can always be employed. I might not be closing more than a deal or two a month, but it was better than not being employed. So I did, I think in 2007, um, when the, 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 you know, we had already been kind of in this tough period for a couple years before the dramatic drop, um, I never gave up the dream of going to college. In fact, while being a, a working adult with four children at this point, I would still take classes. So the online classes became a thing then. Um, I then shifted my focus towards a business degree someday and would take classes whenever I could afford. You know, I went to Schoolcraft online for quite a few years. Just take a class here, take a class there. That kind of became my hobby that I could uh, do after the kids went to school, sleep at night. And I was looking online for an option for um, degree completion. You know, I really wanted a bachelor's degree. And I r found uh, Clear University. So I got on their website, just started looking around, realizing that, hey, I might be able to do this. Back then it wasn't completely online, but mostly online. And they had a scholarship contest for working adults that you had to write an essay and they were going to choose a winner and give somebody a full ride. So I spent a whole bunch of time writing my life history as, you know, why I wanted to go back to school, what it would mean to me. And um, I was a finalist for the scholarship competitions, which was really cool. Interviews um, and all of that stuff. That was a little nerve wracking. Uh, and I didn't win the main prize, but I still won a scholarship. So I made the decision back in 2007 that I would begin school again, again, working full time for Lord kids, children, yeah. my husband being self-employed and helping him run his business on the back end. And I went to school with full course load mm -hmm. for a year. Um, while I, originating while books. while still having my own business my own job running Jim's business and the kids and the kids okay. and the house and the house yeah and I had um, I basically would do my schoolwork I'd stay up till 2 3 a.m. Uh -huh. but I was used to that you know I've always have kind of done two things like I was an originator and a processor so I could be an originator and be a full-time student so I did go full-time for a year um, almost burnt myself out then but I made the dean's list two semesters in a row I was super proud of that and um, ended up taking, I think, a semester off, mm -hmm. and but then I went back. And you got your business degree. Yeah, in 2011, I graduated with my bachelor's in business administration, and it was the year that my oldest graduated from high school. So you got your mortgage originator's license, you've got your business degree, you've got your past with all the trials and tribulations that build character, and I can see this forming into quite a, a powerful character here, you know, and... Uh, and uh, also you were ranked in the top 1% of loan originators uh, across the nation here. Uh, what does that mean? 
You know, it's definitely an honor. It, it's shocking to think about it because I never, and you and I have known each other for about 15 years now. And even at past companies I've worked at, everybody's always numbers focused, right? What's your volume? How many units are you doing? And honestly, I don't really keep very close track of those numbers. You know, you could probably rattle off today exactly where you are this year. I have a rough idea. You know, luckily we have software that helps us <laughs> manage the branch and stuff like that, but I don't focus on it. You know, I, I look at each day as a gift, and if I can go out there, you know, first of all, obviously, my goal is to support my family, is to help take care of my community, and to reach out and impact people, and I know that I have. I've taken people that have been turned down at other mortgage companies. I've helped people uh, build credit appropriately. I've taken people that have, I have had clients go through every horrible financial situation that you can imagine. Or relate to. Or relate, right. But, you know, but especially in the downturn, oh my gosh, especially when we worked at the bank, you'd have people just show up at the mortgage office going, I can't make my mortgage payment. And it wasn't even people that I had done the mortgage for, but, you know, they were so distraught they just needed to talk to a human being. And, um, you know, I've been through my clients, the joys of life, their marriages, births, the downturns, deaths, divorces, you know, people losing jobs, needing to relocate. So uh, as you, as the volume keeps increasing, not that you're out there trying to build your business, it just naturally builds. How do you handle all that volume and yet give a client that personal touch? How do you do that? Do you have people that work with you? I do have a great team. So my assistant Kelly has been with me for eight years now. Um, I've got a great processor and, uh, and recently have expanded our team. So my youngest daughter, Laura has joined the mortgage business, um, with us in the last couple of months, you know, and, uh, her, and she is how old right now? She's going to be 21. And you're bringing soon. her into the biz. Yes. Yes. So yeah. she's going to inherit the relationships and the knowledge that you have. Well, yeah, we you know, I think that there's a huge, with the millennial generation being as big as they are. There is a huge thirst for knowledge. And I think that the technology that we have with the internet confuses people more than it helps most of the time. And I think, you know, traditionally when you look at this millennial generation, they don't trust everything that they read on the internet with good reason because it's not always factual, it's not always accurate, but then they then search for information. So surprisingly enough, with all the awesome technology we have to assist our clients, the amount of people that want to talk before they apply online or want to meet in person is still very, very high. And that's a niche that we can offer and cater to that out-of-state lenders can't do or big dot com mortgage companies can't Meeting do. face to face. Yes. It's in, in really, you know, if we can edu- educate people, it, it our our education system does not really teach any basics of life anymore. You know, I remember being in high school taking, you know, we took home ec. We had to take a basic finance class. We took child development. We took wood shop, you know. Curse, remember? curse of writing. Curse That's of writing. Gone now. Okay. So you have. Calculators. Right. Yeah. Remember when they told us? Well, what did they tell us in math class back in the day? You are not going to have a calculator at your disposal your whole entire life. You're going to need to do math in your head, which I really was really uh, failed at dramatically. Oh, it's kind of funny because I I went to a fast food restaurant and the uh, computer systems were down. I go, well, well, uh, why can't I order? They go, our computers are down. I go, you guys can't add this up, you know, just with uh, a pencil. They go, no. Well, you know, and, and they'll, they'll have to break out a calculator to add just a couple dollars. You know? Exactly. You know? or, or how to make change. Remember when how we were little change. kids? Yeah. Like we, I, I remember having a pretend cash register yeah. oh, we all with did. the yeah. pretend coin yeah. and the little money. And you, you know, you would oh, yeah. sell your stuffed animal to your brother. Or and the good to, humor, the good humor money. Oh, money clip. That was yeah. cool. <laughs> yeah. You, you know, that good humor bell rang. I mean, you were running out yeah. there with the change that yeah, you had yeah. to buy an ice cream bar and you needed yeah. your change back. It's so, not. you know, I, I just, just see a huge disparity in any financial education. And, you know, one of the things that I always tell my clients, especially first time home buyers, is they're trying to save money and figuring out how they can own a house. You know, they don't realize how much more money we spend because we have debit cards. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. Remember back in the day where you could only buy at McDonald's or Taco Bell whatever change was in your cup? Oh, yeah. And we oh. used to return pop bottles for gas money when we were kids. <laughs> yeah, I've done you that. You know, yeah. yeah, you would be like, hey, I got a buck. I mean, yeah, I don't get me wrong. It goes a lot farther then than it yeah. does today, but you just didn't have much. And we didn't have credit, and, and which was good, right? We really didn't get credit too young of an age to screw it up, which right. screws up a lot of people. But nobody teaches their kids about building credit, how to do it responsibly, and carefully as a benefit so that you can then become a homeowner or buy a car or, you know, it, it was, it was those simple principles that I learned early on. And that's what we can teach now. Well, and I've heard many of your clients tell you or ask you, Danielle, why don't they teach us in high school? Why don't they teach us in college? This is the life stuff we need to know. Right. You know, and I don't know why they don't teach it in college. Right. Or, you know, that's... Uh, well, well, we won't even... Ha- we won't go there. As I'm sending my there. youngest off to college yeah. in a few yeah, weeks. Well, mine's and going tomorrow. You know, so. when, when you, yeah, when you look at... Let's talk about electives on a college level nowadays oh, yeah. at any of the public universities. My daughter had to take bongos. You know, she got an A in it, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, that might be fun, and maybe yeah. it would be good exercise. Yeah. But I hope you taught her how to balance a checkbook yeah, yeah, the old-fashioned yeah, yeah. well, way. My, my wife did. There yes, yes. Yeah. Uh, but I, what I want to do is, I just want to fast forward. Tell me about your branch right now. You seem to be very. Uh, you're growing your branch. Tell me about your branch and where you're at today, and where you think you're going. Yeah. So you know, we I switched companies about two and a half years ago. I've had a branch in Brighton, like I said, 15 years, solid for the last 10 or 12 where we've had people. And um, I had an opportunity come up a couple years ago to join a more national-based company that gave us better technology and to support. And I was looking for quality of life. You know, I didn't grow, I didn't have the intent to grow dramatically. And then you called me a few months after we made the change and, um, you were in need of making a change. And, you know, we had a couple of long conversations and um, you didn't have time to go out and do some search to go find the perfect mortgage you. company. You, did. you were my competition, but I still yeah. respected and trusted you. I yeah. remember that day, that conversation. So, you know, what I was looking for was with all the government regulation, I wanted a company that would support us as originators that would give us the technology we needed to compete with all the big dogs, um, allow us to offer a amazing customer service experience for our customers to truly take care of them, and a company that's going to underwrite, approve, and close our loans quickly. And, you know, from the minute that I joined our current company, I was extremely happy with the decision I had made. And then when you called, I'm like, well, I don't think I could have done that. I couldn't have onboarded as many people as we did in such a short period of time without the support of our company. And um, the exciting thing is, is that we have all had um, quite a bit of growth in our, in our production individually and now have a team of 25 people. Um, I honestly think, you know, from a team standpoint, we are probably the biggest, if not the, one of the top two lenders in Livingston County um, as well as probably the Detroit area and have really focused on, hiring seasoned mortgage professionals that want to work hard to take care of our customers, but also make sure that they're taken care of. What do you want to see out of this podcast? You know, we're doing this podcast here. What do you want out of it? What do you want to tell America? I'm hoping that we can reach more people and help educate them and answer their questions in a safe zone, you know, so that people can learn something about the mortgage industry or credit or real estate to in, inspire do. to inspire someone to be able to go, hey, I can own a house. Maybe it'll take me six months. Maybe it'll take a year. Or or if it's advising, and it's not that we just focus on first-time homebuyers, right? We take care of everybody at all stages of life. But we're, help, we're also helping people strategize maybe – entering their retirement years or downsizing from the family home to another home or buying a second home and, and how um, your real estate investments can become part of your 
portfolio for your wealth. I mean, the, the amazing thing. And I, I, lo- I love history. So when I got in the business, I immediately started studying, well, what does the mortgage history mean in America? And how is it different than the rest of the world? You know, the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which gives us our FHA mortgage program, was started um, after the Great Depression in the late 1930s. Now, I won't remember the, mm-hmm. the, the, the dates off the top of my head, but that was started be, to protect the American working people so that they could keep their homes after what happened in the Depression when the savings and loans were run dry. You know, so you look at that and go, okay, and that is different. There's not a country in the world that has the mortgage market that the United States does. Even our bond market is one of the foremost investment vehicles for investors all over the world. And the fact is that working class people can own homes. That is unheard of in the rest of the world for the most part. So is it safe to say that... We are working men working for the working man. Yes, we are. And if we can educate them and reach them, you know, and I've had, I've had ups and downs. I have had good and bad with real estate. I've lost money in real estate, but um, certainly back in the 08 crash situation, um, you know, I've seen my, my house in Pinckney was upside down in value, meaning it was worth less than what I owed Mm -hmm. on it for 10 years after that crash in 08. It, you know, it hurt us, but I also know strategically that when we look at history of real estate in America in the last 50 to 75 years, there is no safer investment. What makes it safe is if you have a good, solid, strong mortgage that you can live with that is not going to put you in a risky situation. So you utilize that mortgage as a tool to create a lifestyle. And well, correct. And eventually wealth generation, right? Our goal is... They'll maybe have that house paid for in 30 years. Or much less, actually. Exactly. And, um, and, and that is, you know, been a principle forever, right? I mean, how we view money and how money works today is different than certainly it did 30 or 40 years ago. For our, even our parents, it was a little different. Our grandparents, it's absolutely different. But you can use it as a tool to, you know, create a home, a safe place, to start building, you know, a rock in a formation um, that the rest of your life will go off. And and that's kind of where my passion was. Yes, it absolutely all revolves around taking care of people. So taking care of people. So we're going to wind down the show with that that note of taking care of people. And on the next episode, we're going to start taking a deeper dive into how we can create wealth, security through your mortgage and, uh, and some other very cool strategies. So uh, for this week, you got any closing words, Daniel? At all? Well, thanks for joining us. Um, We look forward to seeing where A Smarter Way Home takes us um, on this journey. And we hope you have enjoyed this podcast. You can reach us at danielleboot.com or victorbales.com. And we'll see you next time on A Smarter Way Home.